But <laughs> who knows? We'll, we'll be ready. And by the way, y'all, I came to a revival here a couple of weeks ago, and these people revived for hours. <laughs> so we may revive tonight. Praise the Lord. Y'all don't have time to are you? No, I'm from a Baptist church, y'all. We get out of an hour. <laughs> but we're not on any set time frame tonight, so don't even get your hopes up. Y'all need to leave, leave now. I'm telling, you. <laughs> I'm telling you what, you know, the enemy has been working. And, you know, every time I do one of these speaking engagements, you know, I prayed years ago that God would give me the, give me the, uh, I don't know, give me some way to proclaim to people the truth of who God is in my life. And going through the things that I've gone through, which you'll hear something about tonight, Satan does a lot to try to deter that and to dis discourage me. And as he does you, I'm sure. But I just felt so strongly, you know, as I came here tonight, I just had a word for you from the Lord. And I know Tiffany and I, my daughter-in-law and I, were talking this morning uh, and, and yesterday, and I was like, you know, I just, I'm just not getting... You know, the message that I feel like God has for me, you know, my basic message is always the same about our experience, but there's always more you can add to it that God's speaking. Because God's real in my life today. It wasn't 20 years ago. He works in my life every day. And he's the reason I'm able to function and get up and do anything. So the enemy has been working against us, but God is faithful and he's coming through. So y'all get ready. Um, first of all, what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you a few things about some challenges that I've been through. How many of you have read my book? So a lot of you know my story. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that part of it. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. And then I've got some other things that I want to talk to you about. So just I'm going to touch the, the highlights so that those who haven't read it will understand what we're talking about. Um, Sam and I moved here in 1981. We got married in a little church in Arkansas in 1980. And oh my goodness, we weren't ready for marriage, trust me. Uh, but we, we had high hopes and dreams. He was working in the oil field. We moved to Seminole with the oil, with the oil field company. And we bought a little house over on Hoover Street. 914 Hoover. Remember that name? And uh, anyway, we lived there for, gosh, 11 years. All my kids were born in that house. And, but, you know, you start out life with high hopes and dreams. And, you know, your young husband thinks he can, you know, he's got the world by the tail. And all you got to do is turn him loose. And he's got a good woman by his side. He's ready to go. You know my husband. You know how he is. Uh, but he really thought he could do it all. You know, many of you know Sam. I know Kelly used to keep my kids when they were little, two of them. And I've known Carol Dutcher for a hundred years. Many of you I've met through the years, whether when I sell the real estate, I know, uh, tell me your name, Kim. Kim Bellis, I met you when I was selling real estate. I know Mitzi, I know, so many of you know me. And you know my story, you know my husband, you know my family. But you know, when you're a young kid, you guys, a lot of you have children now who are married and starting a family. We do. We start out, you know, we don't have any idea what life's going to deal with us, do we? So we lived on Hoover Street for about 11 years, I think, and started having kids. Adam was our firstborn. He's 31 now, almost 32. And uh, a couple of years later, we had our second son, Brad, and that's the two that killed him. But anyway, uh, Sam started a business, and he always wanted to be his own boss and be self-employed. I always said because he couldn't work for anybody else because they would fire him, basically. <laughs> and uh, he's too bossy. And so he started his own business and has worked for himself for many, many years. And, you know, as you start out, and we found a church, we started going to church, and thank God, I had not been raised in a Christian home, but thank God I found out who God was in time before crisis hit in my life. Anyway, when Adam was about two and a half, we had our second son, Brad, and uh, we had started going to church at First Baptist by that time, and, you know, I wanted to put my children in church, keep them in church, teach them about God's Word, because I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. My parents were a mess. Uh, you know, I always say, you can't tell anything about a person just by their appearance. When you hear, when you get through hearing me tonight, y'all are going to go, oh, Lord, thank God he redeemed her. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Sam and I met in the bar. Oh, is that going to be on camera? Snip, <laughs> snip. <laughs> anyway, everybody that knows me knows that anyway, so whatever. Uh, anyway, so we started out, you know, having children and, you know, going to church, and I wanted my kids to grow up in a Christian home. So, as many of you know, Brad was about three years old. He had just turned three in February, and in March of 19. 
89, we were at Fellowship Hall, like you guys were here, having dinner, and all of a sudden there was a commotion and someone came through the back door and was carrying a child and when that came closer, I could tell by the clothes that child was wearing that it was my little boy Brad. And they said he had fallen. And so I ran to him and he was handed to me. And by God's grace, Dr. Uh, Shy was in the building. He and Carol were there eating dinner. And so I guess Shy was there. He ran over and started ministering to, to Brad. And immediately me and my friends gathered around me. We went to one of the back Sunday school classes and began praying. And I just remember I couldn't think, I couldn't pray, but I knew the Holy Spirit was praying on my behalf. And my sisters in Christ were gathered around me, laying hands on me and praying. And while that was going on, our son was carried in an ambulance to the hospital. And our son did not survive. He died instantly. And you talk about the blood. My goodness, he had just turned three years old. He was perfectly healthy. He was under the care of a pediatrician. And we just, and you couldn't see this coming. Kind of life you know, of you. So that was a huge blow. When you read the book, there's a lot more detail about how God saw us through that time and how Sam was where he should have been and he wasn't out in the oil field where he could have been. He was easily accessible. And so God just, as tragic as it was, we could see God's hand of grace dealing, us, dealing with us through that whole situation. So Sam and I, well, more me than Sam. I wanted to have another child because I didn't want to have an only child. I always felt like I really wanted Adam to have a sibling. And what a tragic way to lose a brother, you know, and, and not know what happened. We never found out what happened to Brad. He just fell over dead in church. And we had an autopsy done and all that, but we never really got a conclusive reason for what happened to him. But anyway, so we didn't want, I didn't want uh, Adam to have another child, so I really wanted to have another child. Sam was reluctant. He had been through so much emotionally. He really was not keen on the idea of having another child. I think he was scared. Uh, men don't like to deal with those kind of emotions. None of us want to deal with a loss like that, but he was just overcome with so much emotion. And so I had to use my womanly charms, and we decided to have another baby. And uh, that's not the biblical way, is it, Mama? But anyway, that's what happened. Uh, anyway, we had a third child. We had our, our son Chase was born a year later after Brad's death. And you talk about the celebration. All my Christian friends were so happy, you know, because you see something so tragic. And then to see someone go through that and then still have the hope you know, that they can keep going through life, it, it encourages you, doesn't it? And so we chose to have another child. Chase was born a year later. And uh, so we started getting our life back to some kind of normalcy. You know, you go through something like that. And, you know, you go through those stages of grief where you just you feel like you're walking through molasses, you know, you go through anger and you go through you know, bargaining and all those things you battle with in your mind when you've lost someone. Many of you have lost a spouse or lost someone close to you, lost a child. That's how Nina and I met her since she lost her little, little baby. And uh, we've been good friends for many years. Anyway, um, so we dealt with all the, the stress and anxiety that came with losing a child. But we did finally overcome that and started trying to have some kind of normal life, you know. We wanted Adam to have some kind of, you know, we didn't want him to pay a price or suffer any more than he had to for, for what we had gone through. So we tried to, to get back to normal. We got back in church immediately. We were, you know, we always trusted God that he would see us through it, and he did. I think, honestly, losing Brad was really hard on Sam. I was at a place in my spiritual life where I was strong and I knew I think God was my rock. And I, it's not that I didn't hurt and I didn't grieve, I did. But I just felt like at that moment in time, He needed to lean on me. You know, I felt like God gave me a little more strength and He was a little bit weaker at that point. Um, so He just, he, he needed that support at that time. Uh, after we had Chase and kind of got things back on even keel, Adam was... 11 years old, Chase turned four, or he was four, and he was almost five, he would have been five in May. Uh, Chase was born at his birthday, which was another little kiss from God, you know, just a sweet gift from God. And so he he was a vivacious, lively, wonderful child, and just, just such a blessing. And so Adam, at the age of 11, uh, 
on Wednesday night, uh, when Chase was four, almost five, Sam had gone to Houston to a business, on a business trip and had just gotten home. We were all hugging and kissing and having a good family time together. And Chase went outside to ride his bicycle. And a few more minutes, a few minutes later, we heard a doorbell ring. And unbelievably, someone said, Chase is hurt. He's falling and he's in the driveway. So we ran outside. I stayed inside to call the ambulance. And Sam and Adam ran outside. And you know, as, as unbelievable as it sounds, it was another Wednesday night. It was March 29th. Brad had died on March 15th, um, six years earlier. And, you know, marches were hard on us. I wanted to skip March for a number of years. And it's just unbelievable the circumstances that were there. I mean, for it to happen on a Wednesday night twice, in March twice, it's just unbelievable. But the good news about that is we lived right across the street from our church at that time. So we had immediate support. People immediately came and started praying for us. Just like, I mean, my boys both passed away within 100 yards of each other. You know, Brad died in the church and we lived across the street in the, in, on Reed Street. So when Chase died in the driveway, we had, you know, thank God, people were headed to church. They stopped and they began to surround us and pray. And we had, you know, our pastor and the people were around us immediately. So once again, um, as a matter of fact, this time Tandy Coates happened to stop. She's an Orient, and she stopped and tried to revive Chase, and just had any luck. And as soon as I saw her space, you know, I knew you could tell that the life had gone out of it. And, you know, if you've ever seen death, you know that the body exists, but the spirit's gone. And so it's very evident that he was not going to be revived. This time, it just about killed me because I had said to God, you know, I've been through this before, and I passed, you know, I, I managed to get through that with my sanity and my marriage intact, but this time I don't think we're going to make it. Because if you've ever known someone who's lost one child, marriages really struggle. Because you is a very personal, very self-centered process because you can't get outside yourself. You, your focus is going within your own needs and your own hurts and your own pain. And so it's very hard to have communication and love and support for another person when you can't you know, manage your own emotions, you know. So my first thought was, oh God, we'll never make it through this. And I, I've lost two children down the other my marriage. But God is so good and merciful. And thank God my husband is a Christian. And we had lots of love and support, lots of church family who came around us and prayed for us. But it wasn't easy. And I think I went into a deep depression after that, and I think I really was clinically depressed. Uh, just simply out of the chemical process. I mean, you lose so much serotonin after, after going through such physical stress and trauma. I talked to my doctor and he said, you've been through so much, you know, that, that it's just traumatizing. So he put me on Zoloft for about six months and I took that to try to even out my moods and make me feel better in it. Made me feel like a zombie. So I got off that. I didn't want to keep feeling like that. But I eventually began to manage my grief better. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. One of the scriptures that I clung to during that time in my life was 2 Corinthians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God, all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we ourselves will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That right there speaks to the purpose of suffering in our lives in a way, because everything we go through, God allows us to minister to other people. I mean, I see it in my church family when we've lost someone or we've been through a that financial reversal or sickness or illness, how often do you be able? How often are you able then to go and speak to someone else and give them comfort and say, you know, I've been there, I've experienced that, and let me tell you that I'm praying for you and I'm encouraging you. And so that's what that scripture spoke to my heart. It taught me immediately that God had a purpose in His pain, and that even though it was unbearable. I had to 
dedicate myself to allow God to use that, to allow that purpose to come through my life. I'll never forget the day that we buried our second child in March of 1995. The day of the funeral, I had told our pastor that if I could manage to keep myself under control, I wanted to say a few words at the funeral because I just wanted people to know that God's not bad, God's not evil, God's good. And what happened to us wasn't because God punished us and it wasn't because he wanted to throw us under the bus. You know, God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. He knows how long we're going to live before we're born. He knows the numbers of hairs on our head. And I wanted people to understand that. So at the funeral, I read a scripture from Galatians 2.20, and that's where the title of my book came from. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and yet I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And other translations say, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So that's where the title of the book came from. And I could so relate to that because I thought, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't persecuted for the cause of Christ, but I knew that he had been persecuted on my behalf and he knew the suffering that I'd gone through. So I so related to that scripture in Galatians 2.20. That's where we decided to title the book. Another scripture that I clung to um, was Nathan 1.7. Our pastor of 17 years, Brother Bob Hammonds, many of you knew Brother Bob, and his daughter Cynthia and I were good friends. Brother Bob's favorite scripture verse was Nathan 1.7. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth those who trust in him. I still sign my books with that scripture because it has been such a stronghold for me. The Lord is good. And when you go through trials like that, Satan tries to tell you that the Lord's not good. And the enemy will come against you. And he will tell you, you don't believe in a God like that, do you? Do you really think he's going to rescue you from these circumstances? Do you really think he's good after allowing this to happen in your life? That's what Satan wants you to believe. But I know that when I read God's word, it's the truth. And the truth says that God is good. And as we talk again tonight, um, later on, I'm going to tell you some ways that God's been very good to me. You know, not everybody's lost a child. Not everybody can relate to that. But, you know, there's all kinds of grief. It's not just the death of a child. I know you in this room have lost spouses. I know some of you have lost children. Um, some of you have gone through financial bankruptcy or a health reversal. You know, you, if you're going along in life and you feel good and life is great, and then all of a sudden you have a, a severe terminal or a, a severe injury or a severe sickness, that's a grief process. When you can't walk, my mother was in a wheelchair. Carol and Bonnie were good friends many years ago when she was still living, and uh, she was awfully good to Bonnie. My mother was in a wheelchair. She had uh, polio when she was pregnant with my husband. She was 23 years old, and she was struck down in the prime of her life with polio, and she could not. She could walk on crutches when she was young, but as she got older, she was bound to a wheelchair. So, grief comes in all kinds of forms, but it still has the same impact and the same result. You know, we still have to go through anger and denial and bargaining and wondering, you know, God, can we can we fix this? You know, what can we do to make this right? And, um, depression. And then eventually we come to acceptance and we have to accept the fact that we can't walk. Or we have to accept the fact that our children are not going to be with us anymore. We have to accept the fact that we're not going to have the financial goals that we, or meet the financial goals that we thought we were going to have. Or maybe we don't get the scholarship at school we thought we were going to have. Or maybe uh, our children don't want a good relationship with us. You know, there's all kinds of things that cause grief. I know a lot of grandparents who are raising their grandchildren because their children are on drugs or they're, they've moved off or they aren't responsible. So there's a lot of things that cause pain in life besides just death. Um, cancer. People, I know a lot of people who've had breast cancer and they've survived that. Loneliness. I know a lot of people who are single women without a spouse, and they're lonely. Um, and I understand Scarlett's starting a single ministry here in this church, which I think is a great thing, or a single women's ministry. Leave for the community. That's wonderful. Um, another thing that's come to my attention since I've talked to people a lot is miscarriage. I know a lot of women who've had miscarriages. I know a woman who has three children and she just had a miscarriage. It's painful. You know, you never get to hold that baby necessarily. Most of the time, you don't get to hold the baby. You don't get to see the baby. But yet, you've born that baby or carried that baby in your womb, and you bonded with that child, and you lose that child, but then nobody ever knows you're pregnant half the time. So then, 
They don't understand, but nobody's there to support you because they don't even know you're grieving. So that's another one. Another thing that, that's very common right now, especially with the war, the military that we're fighting the wars and sending people overseas, is suicide. I know so many people who've lost children to suicide, and it is devastating. This world is full of hurt. It's full of trauma. It's full of pain. And I guess my message to you tonight is I want you to know that the Bible says that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. If you're a Christian, and if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you know the Bible is true and it's the Word of God, you have hope. There is hope. We don't grieve like the world grieves. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind with no hope. Psalm 35 says, we, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And that's true. It may take time. and we, we don't heal instantly. We may not heal for years, but God is in the healing business. He wants us to overcome and heal. I always tell people, I read a book right after I lost Brad. It was called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. And I love that phrase because God allows us to go through things for a purpose. And if we're submitting our will to his will, then we have to submit to that purpose. Don't waste your sorrows. If God puts you in a difficult situation, try to bring good from it. Try to allow him to mold you and shape you and transform you by the renewing of your mind. There's a purpose in that pain, whatever it is. You know, we want to be healthy, wealthy, you know, everything good, no problems. We spend half our lives trying to stay away from problems because we're human. We don't want to have troubles. But often trouble allows us to assess ourselves and to reevaluate where we are in our relationship with God. So don't waste your sorrows. The world needs hope. The world is full of, I mean, look around us. This world's falling apart. We need joy and hope. And the best place to find that is, is, in, a, is in the heart of a believer because we have the Holy Spirit who can speak through us and can minister to others. God's always there and ready to pick up the pieces of our broken hearts, no matter what's happening in our lives. And he's, there's a wellspring of truth and goodness and mercy and love that can flow through us and out of us and spill over other people. And that's what we're supposed to do as Christians is to love others the way Christ loved us. We should be so thankful that we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And because of that redemption, the mercy and the grace of God that's, you know, get there but by the grace of God go I. None of us are above uh, pain and suffering or challenges or mistakes or sin. We're broken vessels and we don't always do the right thing or make the right choices. We don't always respond well when a child dies. We don't always respond well when we have a divorce or we have a financial setback. You know, we don't always do the right thing, but God is there to pick up the pieces and help us mend our broken hearts. You know, another area that I think is challenging in life is in our family life. Um, so many people have dysfunctional family relationships. You know, either their children are estranged or they have a divorce or, you know, it just messes up your family when you have those kind of things. Some people get on drugs or, you know, or maybe you've got a terminally ill person in your home and it's hard to have a functional, normal life when you, when you have those things. Life's messy. Relationships are messy. And families, oh my goodness, are very messy. I came from a home where my mother was a single woman who was dating a married man. She had two daughters, myself and my sister, by two different men. And so she was the other woman. So I grew up as a young girl feeling like I had a, you know, an L or an A or whatever it was they used to put on your forehead when you were an adulteress. Because even as a little child, I took the feeling that it was my fault. You know, I always felt like I should be ashamed because of my mother's sin. And it caused a lot of damage in my heart. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, I think the thing that got me to really manage my grief better was when I learned that you don't have to fall apart all the time. But, you know, at first you can't control your emotions. You have to just deal with it, whatever it is. But I gradually began to understand that if I would allow myself to grieve on a regular basis, if, you know, maybe I had a day where I didn't have a lot of responsibility or had to be someplace. I could allow myself an hour to weep, to cry, to, to pour out my emotions. And then I don't have to do that all day. I can shut it down, try my best to get my composure, and then go on about my day. You know, one good thing about men is they don't want to fall apart. 
So very often they won't breathe or allow themselves to cry because they don't want to just, they feel like they're going to break. And then they can't get all those pieces back together. It's devastating to a man. So I, I encourage women to understand that because if your husband has lost his job or has gone through some kind of difficulty, understand that he, he doesn't know what to do with all that. So have a little compassion and help him to understand the grief process and that it's normal and that he doesn't have to fall apart. I began to focus on the needs of people around me as I got a little further along in my grief process and I began to get back into church and start teaching Sunday school again or working in the church again. I began to see around me that there were so many people who had many needs more, as much or more than I did. And if I could pour myself out to try to help others and try to work through the church and, and share the love of Christ with others, that it would, if I could mend someone else or help someone else's broken heart, it brought healing to me. So I have had a lot of opportunities to speak to women who've lost children. Uh, locally, I know people that have lost children here, and I always try to go and sit with them and hold their hand, uh, you know, pray with them, whatever I can do to help them, and at least know, let them know that they're not alone, that there's someone else that's been through it. Uh, you know, I think if we can learn to use the talents that God's given us, often I hear people say, and I've said this myself, I don't have any talent. What can God do with me? I'm a mess. But we can, we can cook a warm meal. We can give somebody a hug. We can pray with people. I think that's so important. If we can just sit down and pray with someone and tell them that we're lifting them up before the throne, you know, that's, that's invaluable to people. And even if they're not Christians, they'll feel the Holy Spirit. They'll feel the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And they'll know that there's something there that's real. And it's, it allows us to be vulnerable. People can see that we understand and we're not judging them and we're not doubting them because of what they're going through. And often people are afraid to tell you anything because they, they are afraid they'll be judged. You know, especially if they're not living a good lifestyle, if they're living in adultery or whatever. Um, but you can pray with people, you can show compassion to people. There's a lot of elderly people who need need companionship, you know, they're lonely. I always tell people you can write, you can keep a journal. I never wrote in my life, but I would write journal. I would write my journal entries about what I was feeling because that was the best way for me to get it outside myself. So I would start writing my journal. And eventually that's kind of what the book is composed of is my journal writings. The reason I'm telling you this is because I just want you to know that as Christians, if you have the Holy Spirit in you as a Christian, we are compelled by God to go out and minister and serve and give to others. You know, you can share your story. Maybe you're not a public speaker. I certainly not, but God asks me to do something, I try to be obedient, and He usually makes it work out okay. But if you share your story with others, you know, if you've lost a child, or if you've gone through some kind of suffering, or illness, or whatever, share your story. We don't, you know, we're always afraid that we're going to reveal something about ourselves, and people are not going to like us, or they're going to think we're weak, or they're going to think we're, you know, we're less than perfect. And I can remember when I was a young woman, and you know, I was so, I was easily embarrassed because I, I grew up in a very dysfunctional home with a lot of mess going on. And I was afraid to tell people what my life was really like because I thought it was so shameful. And I finally learned as I got older that if I would just tell it all out, and I don't mean you have to go out and put your dirty laundry out in public, but I'm just saying just be honest about who you are, where you came from, what you're going through. People are not going to turn their back on you. People are going to probably appreciate you more because of your transparency, your vulnerability. Because we all think, you know, ours is the worst. We're, we're, you know, we've been more shameful than someone else. And when people hear more about my background, they understand why I, I don't tend to judge people. Um, I always joke about the fact that here I have written a book, and you people are standing here, sitting here, listening to me talk. Well, I always say the Lord uses the uh, foolish to confound the wise because I certainly don't have any speaking ability or any writing ability. But 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So that really is a scripture. You know, share your faith and your hope in Christ. That's something that we can all do. As Christians, that's what we're called to do. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. We're called to do that by God. Give a, you know, Give an answer for what this is in you that causes you to rise up and be able to do your action when things are not perfect and things are not well. The world is full of disappointment and struggles. 
it's never going to end from the time we're born to the time we die. It's, it's going to be like this forever. And those disappointments struggle, and struggles are there to grow you, to challenge you. But Satan wants us to keep our eyes on the circumstances. He wants us to see what's in front of us and be discouraged. He wants us to paralyze us where we won't speak the truth in love and we won't tell others that, that God is the answer through Christ Jesus. And as long as he can keep us fearful and imprisoned in our own minds, then we won't share the gospel. We'll be, we won't be likely to, to reach out and tell, tell others about Christ. Philippians 4.19, we all know the scripture, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And that's so true. God is so faithful. You know, God's even interested in the details of our life. Even the minute details of our life. Um, we pray... When we pray with God, pray to God, and then we listen for His response. We don't hear an audible voice, most of us, but we hear, we hear, we feel in our spirit His communion with us. We hear Him speaking through the Word of God and the Bible. We hear Him speaking through our pastors and our teachers and our lay leaders. And if we have someone we trust in our, in our Christian family, very often they're going to give us a word that is an, is an edifying word, an encouraging word, uh, a challenging word. They're going to they're going to call us out if we're not on the right path. I hope, I pray that my Christian friends will do that. Um, but it's it's like a child. When 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 you have a child, you want them to talk to you. You want that child to come to you in love and share their heart with you, share their hearts with you, share their sorrows and their desires with you. It's just like old grandchildren. I can make them sit in my lap. I can make them tell me this, that, or the other. But if they do it voluntarily, that's what's sweet. And that's what God wants. He wants our communion with Him. Proverbs 12, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. There's another translation of the same verse, Proverbs 13, 12. It says, it's, it's sad when you don't get what you hoped for. But when wishes come true, it's like eating fruit from the tree of life. I love that. When we pray to God, and we share our hearts with Him, and we share our desires with Him. That's where I'm going to make a turn here in this talk. Because as much as the stuff that I've told you about, and about how hard and difficult it was, I want you to hear tonight about the hope. Because the second part of that book title is, Nevertheless I Live, Hope for a Hurting Heart. Because this world needs hope. And we as Christians need hope. We need encouragement. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. When we talk about how hope deferred makes the heart sick, that a longing fulfilled is like eating fruit from the tree of life. I love that. My daughter-in-law just read a book recently, or was reading a book called The Circle Maker, The Circle Maker by Mark Batterson. Have any of you guys read that? Have you? It's awesome, and I haven't finished it yet. But in this book called The Circle Maker, Mark Batterson talks about how our dreams aren't big enough and our prayers aren't big enough. You know, we pray our prayers fearful that God's not going to answer them. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've got a prayer right now that I'm praying, and I'm like, God, I don't know. I just don't know if we can do this. I just don't know how it's going to turn out. And it scares me. And Mark Batterson says that our prayers have to be big enough because God is bigger than we can even imagine. We limit Him, don't we? We're afraid to pray for what's in our heart's desire because we're afraid we won't get the answer. Or we're afraid that He'll say no. Or we're afraid, or we're afraid that he won't hear us or won't pay attention to us. But that's not the way God is. God does pay attention. He does care. He's interested in the tiniest details of our lives. So what I'm going to do right now, I've still got a little time. Y'all aren't ready to leave yet. Um, I want to share with you about 10 or 11 things that I wrote on these notes about how God has worked in my life to give me hope. Some of this is going to be about when I was a little girl. Some of it's going to be about when I'm a grown girl. But hopefully this will give you hope. <laughs> God is interested in the desires of a little girl's heart. When I was a tiny child, I grew up in this terribly dysfunctional family. My mother was seeing this man that was married to somebody else. I had a little sister who didn't even know her father. And I was the oldest, and I felt very responsible for her. And I can remember, at that point in my life, when I was 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, in that age, my mother, in this relationship she had, very often, this man would come to our house, he would park his car, in our backyard and close the gates where nobody could see his car. But everybody knew he was there anyway, but anyway, I don't know. But on the weekends, this man would come to our house, they would park the car inside the gates, close the gates, and then he would not leave the house all weekend. But I never saw him. My sister and I would live in one part of the house, and my mother and her boyfriend would live in her bedroom. <coughs> so 
all weekend long. It was me and my sister. My mother would come out on occasion to make sure we had food, make sure we weren't killing each other. You know, we weren't allowed to knock on the door. If we knocked on the door, it had to be really serious. And this is the way we lived. Well, as time went on, this man began, you know, he drank, he, he was an alcoholic, and his alcoholism got more and more serious, I guess. And I don't remember what had happened the night before, but like on a, it must have been on a week night because I had to go to school the next morning. So I just remember hearing blood curdling screams and hitting and banging, and I often heard him fight. And, I often heard him hit her, I often heard him throwing a knife at the door, you know, breaking a whiskey bottle. Um, and as a little girl, I just kept thinking, you know, I should be able to stop this. Why can't I stop this? Why can't I go and call the police? Why can't I run to the neighbor's house and tell on him and, and have the police come? And, but I knew, I just felt so helpless and so paralyzed. I was so young and so scared. And I didn't want to tell anybody what was happening because then they would know my secret. And then you have to explain everything. Then they might take me out of the home, and I just, you know, I was just terrified. I was paralyzed. Anyway, this particular night, there had been a terrible violent incident. I don't know what happened. I can't remember. But that morning, I had to go to school. And it wasn't, it was close to Easter time. I remember that, because it was in the spring. And I'll never forget, I was about 10 years old, and I was standing outside waiting for the school bus. And I was just pouring my heart out to God. I just, you know, God was my friend. I knew Jesus loved me, because I went to church, and I knew that Jesus loved me just because songs I sang and the scriptures I learned. And I would pour my heart out to God and I would just say, I don't even know what I prayed. I just remember pouring my heart out and telling God how hurt I was and how, how this was wrong and it just, life was so messed up. And I just, I wanted, what I wanted was for him to speak to me and show me that he was listening and he cared and that, you know, there was somebody there that was hearing this prayer. So I had to go back in the house for a second. I guess I forgot the book or forgot something. So I went back in the house and when I walked back outside, this is the first time I remember God really giving me something that I could hang on to. I walked back outside, and on the ground there were these blooms. There were blooms all over the ground. You know, you know it was just the neatest thing. It was so pretty. It was springtime, and you know, you could just see blooms that could fall off the tree and fall on the ground. Well, I picked one up. It was a dogwood bloom. And if you've ever seen a dogwood bloom, what does it have in the center of it? It has the cross. The blood of Jesus is in the center of the dogwood bloom. And there's a story about it read about it. And the interesting thing is there's no dogwood trees around my house. There was no dogwood trees anywhere in my neighborhood that I knew of. I don't know where these blooms came from. But as far as this little 10 year old girl was concerned, I came from the Lord. And it was him kissing me on the cheek saying, honey, I love you. And it's going to be okay. God is good. He cares about the details of our lives. And yeah, that's a silly little story about a 10 year old kid. And yeah, it could have been a coincidence. Maybe a truck driver girlfriend got mad and he threw him out the window. I don't know. <laughs> but God gave me those blooms and he encouraged my heart. And I went to school that day knowing that my God was real. Praise the Lord. One of the things I talk about in my book is about how I dreamed of having a loving husband. Obviously, I had not seen a good marriage. My mother was divorced and was living with a man who was married to somebody else. That's messed up. I'd never seen a loving relationship in my life between a man and a woman. I saw abuse. I saw neglect. I saw abandonment. I saw fear and just not good role models at all. So I had in my heart dreamed that God, is there any man in this world that can just love me? Who could just love me in spite of all that? With the background I grew up in, I should have been a prostitute. I mean, I saw my mother having sex with a man that she was married, was married to somebody else, and it was terrible. But anyway, I just thought, you know, God, is there anybody in this world, is there any man in this world that I can trust, that I can honestly allow, allow into my heart that won't hurt me? I just didn't think there was. I just couldn't imagine that there was. But in God's goodness and in His mercy, when I moved to Oklahoma in 1978, I was working at the University of Oklahoma, and I met my husband there. I met Sam there. And it was an on-again, off-again relationship, and he wasn't perfect. He's not a perfect man, and I'm certainly not perfect. But after a tumultuous relationship, we got married in 1980, and we've been married for almost 35 years. And I want you to know that this man, though he's not perfect, is a loving husband. Last night we were laying in bed, and 
he knew I was coming tonight, and he put his arms around me. And he prayed the most beautiful prayer I've ever heard. Just for me. He sees me with my mask on my face. He sees me in the mornings when I've got mascara running down. And he sees me with my fat clothes and my skinny clothes. He sees me. And he still loves me. He's so good to me. Now, is he perfect? No. He's not. Do I want to choke him sometimes? Sometimes, yes, I do. But he's a good man, and God's given us a good marriage. And, and you young women, let me tell you, if you can hang in there and help help them get through some of their stuff, they'll be better. Love them through it. It's our job to help them through life. It's God's job to make them holy. And let the Holy Spirit work in their hearts, and they'll be better. Anyway, that's another desire of a little girl's heart that was fulfilled. After Sam and I got married, we lived on 914 Hoover. Here's another one. I told Tiffany this one this morning. We were out on the patio this morning, and it was a beautiful day. It was windy, and you know the kids were playing, and the birds were singing. It was such a beautiful morning, and I just I just wanted to play and frolic and you know trim my rose bushes. But we had other things we had to do, and she was watching the kiddos. And I said, Tiffany, you know when I was when I lived over on Hoover Street, that little house on Hoover Street, I used to sit out on my little back. I mean, our backyard was about as big as this half of this room. And I'd sit on the steps and I'd do my quiet time and I'd say, God, if you ever see fit to give me a beautiful patio with rose bushes, I promise you I will read your word and I will come and communion with you every morning and I'll say prayers every morning and I'll be so good. I promise, I promise, I promise. And, you know, he, he, uh, we lived there 11 years in that little house and I did my quiet time on my little back porch. And then eventually we got a nicer house. We moved over on Reed Street and had a nice backyard. I still didn't have my patio that I wanted, but I had a nice backyard and plenty of flowers and rose bushes. But lo and behold, in 2007, we bought this beautiful place. God blessed us, and we bought this beautiful place out in the country. And I've got so many rose beds now that I can't even keep up with them. I've got two two patios, one after another, a waterfall and a lake. And Tiffany and I were out there this morning just praising God, and it's just so beautiful. And is that a big answer to prayer? I don't know. But it was the desire of a little girl's heart. It was the de desire of a young woman's heart. And God saw fit to bless me with that. And I try my best to use it to bless others. I want people to enjoy what we have and to be blessed by it. Okay, so there's another one. The details of our lives. Um, here's another one. After losing Brad in 1989, after the funeral, this is in my book too, part of it. I didn't put the whole thing in there because my father's still alive and I would try to be respectful of him. But after Brad's funeral, my mother and her, well, okay, let me back up. My mother married the man that she used to be with. He divorced and then they got married when Adam was about a year old. Well, after Adam was born. Anyway, so after the funeral, he was with her at my house. And we, you know how you are after a funeral, you're just kind of laying there. Your grief is just raw. And for circumstances beyond my control, I had began to question about who my father was because I thought, I started seeing some similarities in some people that I knew and I'm like, hmm, this lady, I have hands like her and I have eyes like this person. So I began to realize that this man that my mother had been having an affair with all these years might be my father. So the day after the funeral, the day of the funeral, he was resting on my, on my bed and I walked in there and I sat down beside him. I'm terrified of this man. He's a big man, he's very gregarious and he's always scared me to death. And so I, I just remember thinking, you know what, I'm bulletproof. What's he going to do to me now? You know, I'm, I'm, what's he going to do, shoot me? So I went in there and I sat down on the bed beside him, and we had kind of an intimate moment, and I said, is there any chance you might be my father? And he just looked at me and he said, go ask your mother. So I went in the next room, my mother was ironing, and I walked in there and I said, mother, is there any chance that Christy could be my father? And she said, yes, he is. Okay. Now we have to deal with this. So all the years that I was growing up, and all that embarrassment and humiliation that I went through, knowing that he was a married man living in our home, then I find out he's my father. And then I thought, okay, what should I feel about this? It felt like worse rejection, because the man lived in the house with us, and he didn't love me enough to even tell me he was my father. He was with us at times, and he would ignore me. You talk about feeling rejected. I just thought, what's wrong with me? Why would he not want me? 
and bless my sweet husband's heart, when I was going through that, I ended up going through counseling and all kinds of stuff because, you know, when you have a family tree and you think your tree's going this way, then you find out this isn't your father, but your father's over here, then your limb just got broke off because that means not even related to you. And so I was messed up. I mean, I really, I had to get some counseling because I thought, man, you know, these people have lied to me all these years. It was just a mess. So anyway, but my sweet husband, bless his heart, I used to cry myself to sleep at night. Well, we're losing one. <laughs> I would cry myself to sleep at night and bless Sam's heart. He would hug me and say, hey, I don't know what's wrong with him, but any man that doesn't want you for a daughter, there's something wrong with him. You know, I would love to have you for my daughter. And he'd just hug me and let me cry. And he's a good man. Anyway, my point in telling you all that is I just want you to know that I had to forgive the man. He's still alive. He's 98. He's going to be 99 in July. I still see him on a regular basis. I even talk to him on the phone. We FaceTime with my grandkids and everything. And I've totally forgiven my father. I, You know, I still don't know if he's a Christian. When you ask him, does he know the Lord? He says, oh, yeah. yeah. I, made a, I went down the aisle when I was seven, and I made a profession of faith. And, yeah, I got that. And even Sam recently asked him again. He said, yeah, I'm ready to meet my maker. So, I mean, you have to take him in his word. I don't know. But fruit... That tree was bare. There's no fruit. And, you know, that's in God's hands. I can't judge his heart, but it's just a sad thing. The one I want you to hear from that story is I learned a lot from that experience. I learned to forgive. I learned that a little girl who's quiet and shy and backward and afraid of everything may have more troubles than what you see on the surface, you know. And I always have compassion for young women because I know that you never know what they're going through at home. Some of them are molested, some of them are treated terribly. You just never know. So I learned a lot through that. But God wove that part of my life into my character. And he taught me through that to love the unlovely. This man still is not a lovely person. He goes and gambles. And he's at 98, drives himself over to gamble with some dude in a bar. I'm thinking, man, you need to be in charge. <laughs> but anyway, um, but I, I learned that those that, that are the least lovely are often the ones that need love the most. He's never known love. I really don't think he's ever experienced love the way he should have. Um, another thing that happened is after I had Chase, and um, and then we lost Chase when he was almost five. Um, now let me back up. When Chase was born in 1990, uh, I was perfectly healthy and great health. And then a year later, I had a pap smear, and I had beginning stages of cancer. I had cervical cancer. So here I was, just had a baby, had already lost one child, had a baby, had another little boy, and then I found out that I was going to have to have something done about the cervical cancer. So we ended up having a hysterectomy. But the thing is, because I went through that, and I began to wonder, why did I have cervical cancer? And it began an investigating process in my mind. I began to realize, it's a long story, but I began to realize that I had been molested when I was a little girl. And I was a victim of incest, and I just squashed all those memories because it happened when I was little and it was kind of woven into my family so it really wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like there was a big blow up or anything. Nobody knew about it. It was just like, you know, it just was something I just pushed in the back of my mind. I rationalized that it was normal. It wasn't a big deal. But then I started realizing, you know, that's not normal and it wasn't good. So anyway, that was another thing that I ended up having to deal with. See, I told y'all you weren't going to believe all this. Um, Anyway, through that, I began to realize that, you know, I, I had to have my uterus removed and I couldn't have any more children. And then, of course, after we lost Chase, I couldn't have any more babies. And then a lot of people wanted me to adopt, and I just, I just didn't have the mental fortitude to do it. I was just exhausted and tired, and I was terrified that if something happened to that child, I, would be, I wouldn't be capable of taking care of them. I just I was so scared. Anyway, so, but God worked through even that, you know, all those things led me to research and learn and to understand um, family dynamics and why things happen the way they do and, you know, pray and he brought Sam and I closer and so there was a lot of good that came from even that. And then another thing I want to mention too is before Adam was born, I began praying for his wife because I knew that the secret to having a close relationship with my son would be to have a wife. And I didn't even know I was having a boy at that time. I mean, I was still pregnant with Adam. But I knew enough, and I had read enough in Scripture, and I had been to enough Bible studies that I knew that I should pray for my, my little boys, my little girl's spouse before they were even born. So I began praying, even then, 
And needless to say, those of you that know my daughter, Ma Tiffany, know that my prayer was so answered. It's just beautiful. Just a quick tidbit about that. She was raised in a very different home, a biracial home, biracial marriages, and her mother was Mormon. She was raised Mormon. Her aunt was uh, Muslim. And, you know, that wasn't exactly what I prayed for, but once I got past that, it was all good. But that was a biggie, I'm telling you. You know, uh, but when Adam brought Tiffany home the first time, and, you know, I got to know her a little bit, but anyway, as I got to know her, I fell in love with her because I just adore her. We're like best friends now. And so God so answered that prayer. And the neat thing about that story is when Tiffany was a little girl, she tells me that she prayed for her mother-in-law. She always wanted to be close with her mother-in-law because she felt like that was just a great way to bring her family close to her and to, to be a bond, bond with her husband's family. And she and I are the closest of friends. And yes, we have our disagreements that we work through and we just keep going. And we both love the Lord more than you know, than anything else, so it works out. So I praise God for, for my daughter-in-law. I can tell you story after story, but I don't want to bore you to death. Another way God's worked out the details in my life, my mother in 2010 was 69 years old, and she was at a family meeting with her brothers and sisters. She had nine, counting herself, there were nine children, so there were eight brothers and sisters. One of them passed away, but there was like seven of them there. They had a family meeting, and my mother ended up being abused. My brother, my, her brothers attacked her physically and beat her. She had a heart attack on the spot. 69 years old, almost 70 years old. And, you know, that was, oh my gosh, that was a terrible time. That was just in 2010. And she's 70, she'll be 75 this year. There was a court hearing about it and all kinds of stuff. Nothing was ever done about it. But we had to learn to forgive. And what happened through that experience was my mother had to come to terms with some family issues that she had. And, you know, again, forgiveness. You have to learn to forgive those who abuse you. That's what the Bible says. So we had to learn to love people that were not very lovely. Um, struggling financially is another thing I want to talk about. You know, our Sam has businesses here in town, and he's got a business out in South Texas. And you know, if you've ever had to make payroll for 150 people, you struggle at times. You know, it, it gets tough. And there have been times when we thought, Lord, I just don't know how this is going to work. Right, Scarlett? <laughs> Scarlett can testify. She works for us at the office, but. Um, Anyway, I've seen God come through miraculously so many times. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, just in the nick of time, we're like, okay, where's this coming from? And he always comes through. But we try our best to be obedient to him and honor him with our resources. And, you know, Sam's a big believer that God is his partner. And 10% of everything he makes in that business goes to the Lord. And that's just a, an agreement that he's had with all of his partners. And if they don't want to do that, then they don't need to be a partner. Because that's just the way, that's just the way he believes. Um, another thing right now, and this is kind of a vulnerable spot for me to talk about, uh, our little cousin who's 14 years old, Sam's cousin who's 14. Those of you who are my Facebook friends, which are many of you, you know that Zebediah Montgomery is 14 years old. He's in Children's Hospital, Cook's Hospital in Fort Worth, and he's struggling with leukemia. He has the worst kind of leukemia that they can have. And he's been in the hospital in and out for most of the last year. And to be honest with you, this is what I was talking about, praying the big prayers. This is the one that terrifies me because we've seen this child go through three or four different kinds of chemo and an experimental drug, and we're like, God, please, you know, just have mercy on this child. Can we, of all the people that you can heal in the world, can we not see a supernatural healing right here in this world? He's so beautiful and precious, and his parents are struggling. His dad's really trying to keep a, you know, he has a landscape business, but he can't really work because he's struggling so to keep the family going. And his mother is was a school teacher. She had to retire because she can't work. She has to be in the hospital all the time. And then they have an older child who's 16. And to be honest with you, I'm really concerned about their marriage. Because how long can you endure that kind of strain and stress and financial challenge? We got a text from David today, though, the dad. And I was so thrilled. And we were praising God. This morning, Tiffany and I were on our knees praying with our grandchildren, my grandchildren, on the floor in a circle of prayer, praying for this little boy that because they're going to test his bone marrow today. And we were just praying, God, please don't let there be any cancer cells in his bone, bone marrow, because if he's cancer-free, then they can do a bone marrow transplant. His brother is a, is a donor that can do the bone marrow transplant. And so we prayed that, and our hearts have been so heavy for him. And then this afternoon, about 
three o'clock or so, I got a text from my dad, David, and he said, hallelujah, praise God, the bone marrow was cleared, there's no cancer in his bone marrow, praise God. So God cares about the details of our lives. He cares about the desires of our hearts. And this child's not out of the woods yet. They're still going to have, there's a lot of, he may have to have bladder surgery, and there's some, he, you know, there's a lot of things going on. But that little bit of hope. You know, that answer to prayer. No leukemia cells in his bone marrow. You know, that's that's awesome. God does care about us. Okay. Another thing I want to tell you real quick. This is a cute story. You'll appreciate it. Because Tiffany thinks this is so sweet. About, I don't know, it's been about a month ago now. I've always wanted a piano. When I was a little girl, I used to play the piano. And I never owned a piano. All my life. So I've always told Tiffany, if, I, if I'm going to get a piano now at this age of my life, I want a baby grand piano. You know, I don't want to upright. I, don't, I just want a baby grand. If I can't have a baby grand, I'll just wait till I get a baby grand. And I've looked at them online. I priced used ones, old ones, broke down ones, you know, everything. And I kept thinking, you know, it's not a high priority. My husband's not got that on the top of the list, you know. But I made him aware of it, okay? And it's so cute the way this worked out. About a month ago, we have a house over on Reed Street, and some people had moved out of it, and I was over there checking the house out because we put it up for sale and everything. And I walked in that house, and lo and behold, what was sitting in the living room? A baby grand piano. And it wasn't a white one. It wasn't one hot pink like Liberace. It was a black, mini, you know, six foot baby grand piano, just like I wanted. It would fit perfect in my living room. So I texted up the guy that had it, and I was like, Tony, what are you going to do with this piano? Is it, are you going to get rid of it, or are you going to sell it? What are you going to do with it? He said, well, I'd like to sell it if I could. And I said, how much do you want for it? He said, well, would you trade me for it? Yeah. And I said, you betcha. So we worked out a deal, and I got that piano for no dollars. And it's sitting in my living room. So God cares about the desires of a little girl's heart. Hallelujah. Okay, and then finally, the last story I'll tell you is, and this is one that's dear to my heart, isn't it just like God, for someone like myself who's lost two beautiful, precious little children, a three-year-old and a four-year-old, guess who lives in my house about 90% of the time now? My grandsons, who are three and four at this moment. They're going to grow up, obviously, Lord willing. But right now, I get to hold them and love them, and they don't replace my children, but it's just so beautiful. Isn't it just like God to give you that sweet hug? And I get to hold them and love them and teach them and train them, and Tiffany's so generous, too generous sometimes with her time. <laughs> <laughs> she knows when Nana starts getting tired. I, I, I kept them for four months because she was working in the office, and I, I said, well, I'm super Nana. And then about two or three months later, I said, well, I'm broke down, Nana. <laughs> Out on my last leg every day with three kids, a four, a three, and a one year old. Well, anyway, but isn't that sweet to know that God, in His beautiful, gracious way, just gives you that hug? I just, I just think that's a cool story. Thank you, Lord. I love that. Romans 8 28, we all know it, it says, He works things all together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. He works all things, good things, bad things, sad things, trying things. All things work together for good if we are called his previous purpose. Um, today I've talked to you a little bit about the challenges that I went through in my life and how Sam and I made it through them. But what I want you to hear from this message is how God restored my hope. You know, it was pretty hopeless after losing two children. That was, you know, if you could ever find a place in your life where you felt despairing. That's where I was at. But God restored my hope. And He restored my hope so that I might share that hope with others. And that's what I try to do. I try to share that through this book. I try to share it with people in church and through speaking to ladies groups. I'm going to be in Weatherford, Oklahoma in April and I'm going to be in Hera in April. And I don't publicize speaking events. I don't consider myself a speaker. But I always say, God, if you open up a door, I'm going to walk through it. And if you invite me, and most of the time it's people that have heard or know me from somewhere that I invite me to the church. And I just want you to know that our faith grows as we experience God day by day. When we pray and we have these interactions, those little things I just told you about, some of them are big, some of them are little, but it's through that relationship 
You know, it's an abiding in Christ. It's a relationship that it doesn't ever leave. It's part of who we are. It's the fabric of who we are. And so our lives are woven together in that beautiful tapestry that looks so beautiful on the top, and then underneath you see all the messy stuff. But God weaves all that stuff together and makes our lives valuable and worthy and, and full of purpose and meaning. You know, if we look around and see spring breaking out all around, doesn't that remind you of the hope that we have in Christ? You know, the, the dead trees are starting to come back to life. And that's the way we are spiritual. We go through dry spells. I went through some dry times after my son passed away the second. And I just didn't know how I was going to get out of it. So we do. We go through dry seasons. But through those times, we have to know that God is good. He's faithful. We don't let Satan tempt us to believe anything other than that. And through God, we have our hope. That's, that's the only hope that we really have. And guys, as Christians, we should be full of joy. Full of joy. Because that's what draws the world to us. It's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. And when we see and anticipate the beauty and wonder around us that God's given us in nature and in so many ways, I look out and I see the beautiful springtime and I think about all the tragedy that's going on in the world. And it's hard for us as humans to balance that because we think, you know, how can it be so tragic one way and then so beautiful another way? But God is good. He's everywhere. He's in the middle of Afghanistan right now. He's fighting on the battlefield in Syria or wherever they're fighting over there now. And I'm telling you folks, he's coming soon. You know what? I don't know if it's today or tomorrow or next week or next year or 10 years, but he says that our redemption draws nigh. We went to Israel back in October, and I told Sam, you know, I was terrified of flying that far and being over there close to Syria and all that blowing up stuff and everything. And I said, oh, Lord, if we go down, at least we'll be closer to you in heaven. You know, we'll be up in the air. We went this far to go. And <laughs> once we got to... Israel, I said, Lord, if you're going to touch your foot down on the Mount of Olives, I just love it if you do it while I'm here so I can see it. <laughs> but anyway, God gives us hope and He renews our hope every day if we let Him. And you know, I just have to say this before I close. If we, if anybody here doesn't have that personal relationship with Christ, if you don't know that Him as your personal Savior, I just challenge you to talk to someone here. There's all kinds of people here that would be, just be thrilled to talk to you about that relationship. I know many of you now already know each other. Many of you are already members of this church. But if there's any doubt about your, your relationship with God, please let somebody um, help you and direct you on that. Um, Tiffany and I recently heard a statement that I just, I really, this really lit me up because I thought this is so true. And that statement is, we, we were actually practicing this in business, but it applies so much to our spiritual relationship. <coughs> and the statement is, if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not big enough. You know? And I think about our relationship to God. If your relationship with God, if your love, and if, when you see the mercy and the goodness of God, if that doesn't make you cry, it's not big enough. Because look what he's done for us. How grateful should we be to know that he can redeem us through, through all of our sinfulness and all the things we've been through. And if we're faithful and we confess our sins and we seek him as our Lord and Savior, he's, he's going he's gonna to step down from heaven and lift us up and we'll be his and he'll hold on to us, and he'll never let us go. He won't reject us like the world rejects us. So ladies, I could talk another hour, but I figured y'all want to go to bed sometime tonight. And uh, I appreciate your attendance. I hope something that we've shared tonight was encouraging to you, and uh, now we're going to have our karate display. <laughs> thank you, ladies. Let me say a quick prayer before we go. Father God, I thank you so much for these beautiful, beautiful ladies. Thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to share your truths with them. Lord, I thank you for my past, my present, and my future. And may it be a, a beacon of hope for those who, who uh, see my life and watch my life. God, I thank you for this church and these, these leaders in this church that who, who have opened their, their home, their church up to so many. And they're growing and they're sharing the good news with young people. What a blessing. Thank you for Norma and those that worked tonight to prepare this event. And I just am honored that they would have me here tonight. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.